Christine, we're getting our webcam on right now. All right. Can you can you hear us all right, Christine? I can hear you just fine. Is my volume good? Yeah, you sound good. I did just want to go ahead and say to everybody that we will be recording this webinar. Um, so just a heads up, that recording will be available um, shortly after, maybe tomorrow or so. Um, so just know that this is being recorded. Um, and yeah, I guess with that, we can go ahead and get started. What do you think, Christine? I think it's a great time to be here. All right, guys. So I just want to introduce you all um, from, from here at SSI in Boulder, Colorado. My name is Brooks Mitchell, and I'm here with Kelly and Lacante. We're part of the professional development team. And we are um, kind of spearheaded of this StarNet project, uh, which is a way to connect librarians with different STEM resources uh, and with different space science resources. LPI is one of our wonderful partners on this project, so we are thrilled for them to be hosting uh, or helping us host this webinar today. So we have a lot of content. We have a lot of hands-on activities. I don't really want to um, take up any more of Christine's time. So uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you, Christine. Um, and we'll, we'll just be here kind of in the chat box monitoring your questions and your comments. And so yeah, we'll see you guys all soon. Thanks so much, Brooks. Thanks, Kelly. And let's go ahead and get started. My name is Christine Shupla. I'm at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And we are indeed delighted to be a partner on this project. Um, let's go ahead and uh, tell you a little bit about what you're going to be seeing today. I'm certainly not here alone, and you will be meeting several people here uh, in the next 30 minutes. But, OK. Let's try this again. I'm sorry. I'm going to resync the PowerPoint again. It was working. All right, so there's a variety of resources that you will be finding out about. We're only going to be sharing three activities right now, but there are so many different ones. First of all, the StarNet space science resources are innumerable, and you can go to them on their website and learn more. And Brooks and Kelly and would be delighted to tell you more about the resources, discussions, other webinars, and other related opportunities. Here at LPI, we have the Explore program, which is designed for libraries and for camps and other out-of-school time programs. We use a variety of inexpensive materials. And we highlight different concepts through investigations, demos, crafts, and conversations. You are invited to all join our community as well. We have a Facebook page. Please join us and post what you're doing and your questions there. Uh, we Please email us. We also have a website with a variety of activities. And the activities we're going to be highlighting today are from the Explore program that have been adopted by the StarNet library a program. So these are the three activities we're going to be doing. Jump to Jupiter, Investigating the Insides, and Strange New Planet. So Jump to Jupiter is about scale models of our solar system. We're talking about space here. So we have a poll question for you. And Brooks, please go ahead and open up the poll. So if the sun were the size of a grapefruit, which of these items do you think would represent the size of the Earth? So if, if you can imagine how big a grapefruit is, and if you have difficulty imagining, I do here have one for you. If the sun were a grapefruit, how big would the Earth be? Would the Earth be a tangerine, a pinto bean, a grape, a little crystal of sea salt? Which one represents the Earth if this were how big the sun was? So we're voting, and um, I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds. and. Maybe five more seconds, four more seconds. Everybody go ahead and vote. Three and two and one. And the answer is, Brooke, should we tell them the answer? The answer is the sea salt crystal. So yay, a lot of you did get it right. A lot of you picture in your head that it was bigger, though. You can fit 100 Earths across the sun. So you have to be able to fit 100 across. And can you imagine fitting 100 beans across a, a line on, on our little grapefruit? That wouldn't quite be possible. Um, but the pinto bean, you know, that's about the size of Jupiter compared to the sun, actually. The pinto bean would be about right for Jupiter. So that gives you an idea of size. Size is hard to imagine. Distance is even harder. So we're going to go ahead and we are going to, yeah, this happens. When we do polls, I have to resync the program here. So um, if the sun were the size of a grapefruit, here you can see a picture of how big the planets would be. The sun has 99% of all the things in our solar system. 
And those other planets are so much smaller. Um, here we've got a close-up of little Earth and Venus and Mars and Mercury and Pluto. Pluto is still there. <laughs> it hasn't been destroyed. Um, Jupiter, on the other hand, like I said, Jupiter is about one-tenth the width of the sun. So Jupiter could be a pinto bean, potentially, if the sun were a grapefruit. Um, there's little Pluto. Um, so that's how big they are. The planets are all much smaller than the sun, but how far apart are they? If the sun were a grapefruit, we've got our second pole here, folks. Uh, if the sun were a grapefruit and the Earth were a sea salt crystal, how far apart would they be at this scale? So if the sun were our grapefruit, would that little sea salt crystal just be six inches away from the sun for the Earth? Would it be a foot away? Would it be, um, well, 10 feet away or 50 feet away? How far away from this grapefruit would the Earth be? And we're going to give you five, four, three, two, and just one more second to vote. And the answer is, indeed, 50 feet away. Wow. It's hard to imagine, right? That little sea salt crystal 50 feet away. So we're going to help you imagine it with this activity. We are going to be taking a field trip, though, for it. It's kind of hard, otherwise, to see how far away we are talking about. So for our little field trip, we are going to do jump to Jupiter. Now, the scale model is pretty easy to set up with signs, and we have some. And Yolanda is going to be turning on her video, and we are going to be exiting the building and learning about the scale model here. Now, so um, let's go ahead. Uh, uh, Brooks, can we switch over to Yolanda's video? Hey, Christine, give me just one second. I've got her as a presenter, so she should be able to pull up her video. OK. All right, we will get her video pulled up. Yolanda, make sure your video is being shared. All right, we've got her video feed uh, up, and it's clear, so we're good to go. OK, Yolanda's phone is uh, reconnecting again. It lost the signal for a second. So we're starting over again with sharing the video. Can you see her video? Nope. OK. So Yolanda is sharing her video. Christine, I'm not sure. It's not coming through on our end. Um, we could go ahead and just put that YouTube video in the chat box uh, for folks to watch the, the Jump to Jupiter um, how-to video in the future. OK, yes, we can do that. We can go ahead and put the video in the chat box. Great. There's a one video that you can see on your own time. It's only a couple minutes long while people hop through the the, the system. OK, Yolanda, go ahead and pause that or, or turn it off because it's a little distracting. And let's tell the guys to come back in, and we will continue with the next activity. And while we're getting our, um, our team back together, let's go ahead and tell you a little bit more about this. So the um, Jump to Jupiter, you can set it up with different signs. You can arrange the signs inside of your facility or outside, if you have a good space outside, down the hallway. Or if you, have, if you don't have a good long space, because this potentially could take up tremendous amount of space, you can actually have it wind back and forth. So you could have it, for instance, 
in rows or aisles or, or around a hallway where you start at one end of the hallway and go down and then back the other side of the hallway. Um, so there's numerous ways you can set it up, but there's signs you can print and put up on the walls or attach to sign holders. Um, dowels work well. And, uh, and you just have the kids hop. How many hops does it take to get to the different objects? And at this distance, so um, if Mercury is 6 meters or 20 feet away from the sun, the Mercury sign would be you'd measure it off at 6 meters away from your sun, and you would see how many hops it takes the kids to get there. It might take about six hops. If, uh, if your person is very tall, it might take fewer. For instance, one of the people we were going to have demonstrate this, Andy, is, is pretty tall. And so therefore, it might only take him four hops to get there instead of six, um, and, and so on. Um, if you have a limited amount of space, as it's called Jump to Jupiter, the reason is because Jupiter really isn't, it is, is 37 hops away. Once you start to get to Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and Pluto, you're going to need a lot of space at this, at this, um, at this scale. So we have a comment that someone is having difficulty hearing um, and that their volume is turned up all the way. Um, Brooks, can you make sure that the volume is turned up just a tiny bit more? Yeah, certainly, Christine. I'll uh, check into that now. OK. And so, um, so this is a pretty easy activity to set up and to arrange things. It doesn't take very long to, to switch. Um, uh, and you can also modify it if you needed to modify it to make things a little smaller. Um, there are ways to do that as well. Um, Juno is a mission that's currently at Jupiter. This activity was created for the Juno mission, and it is studying Jupiter's unique characteristics, its atmosphere, magnetic field, and gravity. Um, and so, yes, Anne, a large lawn would be very helpful for this activity. Um, we're going to go ahead and do a couple more activities now. So. Um, this next one, investigating the insides, you get to examine mystery balloons or balls as a model for how we study the interiors of planets. And all of these activities are available online. And so, um, Joey, let's go ahead and switch cameras now. Um, while we do that, I can let you know that we are going to be, um, uh, while we're switching to the side camera, um, you can see that um, over here we have several folks with us. I'm going to let you each say hi. Hey, this is Steve Liu. And Steve is one of our scientists here. Uh, he studies Mars. I'm Yolanda. And Yolanda Ballard is our administrative assistant. She helps to make everything happen. Uh, I'm Andy. And Andy is my cohort up in education who also does webinars and workshops and all sorts of things. So here we have three balloons. Each one is representing a, a random uh, planet, and we're going to let Johan, they're fighting over who has to have the messy one. Um, as they're going to analyze these, they're going to try to determine what's inside of these balloons. These balloons are double ballooned. One balloon is inside of another to make it harder to determine what's inside. Um, and uh, <laughs> so while they're analyzing it, they have some magnets. They have some, um, uh, they can pick them up. They can shake them. They can listen to them. They can see uh, if it attracts a magnet, if it attracts a paper clip. What noises they might hear? Shake that again. Oh! OK. <laughs> and be forewarned that if you put water in the balloon, it might pop. Be prepared for that as a possibility. Um, <laughs> so um, <laughs> this does happen at times. And when you pop your planet, it gives you some insight as to what materials might be inside of a real planet. And we have examples of planets that have been popped. Um, um, <laughs> and those are in, in real life called asteroids and meteorites. But Andy, um, you may be excused. Why don't you go get some paper towels? <laughs> and, uh, um, and so while he's doing that, Yolanda can see that her, her planet seems to have something. What would you infer for, about your planet based on the fact that the magnet is grabbing it? Uh, what would you infer? What would you infer? What do I think it is inside? What's inside? What do you think's inside? Metal. She thinks that it might have metal inside of it because it's attracting a magnet. Steve, how about you? What, what, can you infer anything about yours? No, actually, I 
There's no magnetic inside. No magnetic inside. Um, does the sound or the weight tell you anything? Or the distribution? Mm. What is that? Not really. Not really. <laughs> is, would you say it's made out of light materials or heavy materials? Light materials, for sure. Light materials. And, um, and uh, um, is it making any noises? Yes, there's some noise. Some noise. So the, the materials are, are kind of loose in there. And if we were to examine the contents of a popped planet, we might find assorted things like paper clips and magnets and beads. Um, of these, which one do you think might be in this one? See again. If, if we examined the interior of the popped planet, we might find pieces of magnet, we might find uh, pieces of um, beads, and, and we might find pieces of paper clips. What do you think, based on that, you might find in here? Paper beads. beads. Maybe some beads. There might be some beads in there based on our analyses. So that's kind of how we know what's going on inside of um, other planets when we're examining them. So. Um, you can ask your participants to use their senses, their tools. You can give them magnets or paper clips. You can give them um, temperature gauges. You can give them uh, scales and ask them um, how the mass is distributed. What does it sound like or feel like? Um, and you can use these, uh, this as an analogy to what's inside of a real planet. Because of course, when we're examining other planets, we can't look all the way to the inside, but we can analyze the magnetic field, we can analyze the gravitational field of those planets. Um, in addition, if you don't want to risk it with balloons, you can also use plastic eggs. Here we've got a plastic egg that we've wrapped and put mystery substances inside of, um, and this one wobbles. And you can hear a little bit of noises in that. Um, I also wanted to just briefly describe how you double balloon a balloon. You uh, start by taking two balloons. Those of you who brought materials with you to this webinar, you can uh, pull out your balloons now and try uh, to, to take one. And you can um, kind of fold it a little bit in half and try stuffing it inside the mouth of the other one before you put anything inside of it. And you'll wind up with one balloon inside of another one. And then you can add beads or paper clips to the first balloon, to the inside balloon. And then you inflate it and tie it off, push it in, and then inflate the outside balloon and tie it off. And that's how you make a double balloon um, that is stuffed with materials. Because balloons, it's really hard these days to find a balloon that's opaque. So we are running a little bit low on time. It can be a very messy material, but it's a lot of fun. And as you can see here, here's, uh, there's directions on how to make these as well on the website. Um, this is one activity you might want to do in conjunction with the Cassini mission. The Cassini mission is ending this Friday. It, is, it has been in orbit around Saturn for many years, since 2004. And it launched almost 20 years ago. But this Friday, it's going to be diving up into Saturn's atmosphere to burn up. Um, they don't want to leave it in orbit around Saturn because it could pose a risk. Saturn has several moons, including a couple, that could potentially have some form of microbial life inside. And we would hate to go there, look for life, and then discover Earth bacteria that were left behind when one of our missions crashed there. So in order to prevent that from happening, this mission is going to be going into Saturn on Friday. So final poll question. Scientists explore the solar system using which of the following? Brooke, can you go ahead and set up that poll question for me? OK, we're going to give you just a couple more minutes, uh, actually a couple more seconds to vote here. We're going to give you a few seconds to vote. How do we explore the solar system? Do we use telescopes on Earth or in space? Do we use spacecraft? Uh, do we land on the objects? What do we do?
All right, they might be figuring out some audio um, issues over at LPI, but I'll just jump in real quick. Okay, and the answer is indeed all of the above. Perfect. Wonderful. And so for this last activity that we're going to do very quickly, we're going to tell you a little bit about the stages. Um, Andy, can we move the table out of the field of view? Um, we have we have a bit of a disaster here with our exploded planet. So um, the um, and Brooks, my sync button isn't showing up right now. So I need to. There we go. Now it is. So there are a variety of ways that we study things uh, with telescopes, both on the Earth and in orbit. Uh, we have missions that fly by, such as the New Horizons mission that flew, by, flew past Pluto the other summer, the Cassini mission that's currently in orbit around Saturn, but not for much longer, and the Curiosity rover on Mars. So for Strange New Planet, we're going to simulate this series of ways that we discover things, the ways that we observe and learn about new objects in the solar system, or that we study things that we already knew about. Um, Participants work in small groups, uh, usually three to six participants in each group. They take turns being the observer. The observer then communicates what they see to the others in their group. So, um, and that's one way to do this. There are multiple ways, but one way is to do it in small groups. So if you have uh, 20 kids, 30 kids, you could divvy them up into these small groups, and each group has uh, one person who takes their time being the explorer and communicating what they saw while the others do not get to look at the planet. The others all look away. However, we're going to modify this a little bit. Now, there are a series of stages. Um, and we're going to go ahead and switch to the side camera now. Um, and at the side camera, I'm going to tell you a little bit more here about what we do. So um, when they're looking through the telescopes, they have these very fancy telescopes that you may have as well at your own institution. Um, when they're looking at the planet through the Earth's atmosphere, they are impeded by the Earth's atmosphere. Joey, can you hold the blue cellophane up here for a second? We're going to impede your view with the blue cellophane. So imagine you are looking through a tube that's covered with that blue cellophane, and you are going to be taking an observation, and we would actually only have some of you make the observations, but in the webinar, you can all do it. You would all get to observe it for five, four, three, two, one, and let's go ahead and put the cellophane away. So you would then share out your observations with your group. How, what did you see? How many features did you see? What did it look like? What questions do you have? If you don't have good questions, then there's no reason to fund you for another set of observations. But if you have some good questions, and I imagine some of you do, because a lot of you are probably thinking, I have no idea what that was, you can take another set of observations. So your second set of observations would be with a telescope, but without the Earth's atmosphere in the way. And so you would use the tube that I'm holding in my hand. and uh, But since you've got time on the Hubble, we would give you 10 seconds on the Hubble. And here you go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And that was your time. Not a whole lot. You probably have some more information now, some ideas about colors, some ideas about shapes of features. But you probably still have many questions. And if any of those questions are worth answering and worth funding, we might fund a flyby mission. So we're going to do the flyby mission. Here we go. Again, one person from each group would be set to observe. They would use their little handy-dandy telescopes to observe as they walk past the object, while the others all look away. But you can all look. Here we go. We're going to keep this to five seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. And you may have new questions now based on those observations. Your flyby got to see some features up close, but it didn't get to see that many, right? You didn't get to see the whole planet. But if your questions are sufficiently interesting, we could fund an orbiter. And that orbiter would allow you to go around the planet, make at least one complete orbit. So here we're going to do an orbit now. 
And with this orbit, you might see some interesting features and some interesting colors. And you might have entirely new questions with your orbiter as it's going around. And if your questions now are sufficiently interesting and worth the money, they might fund you to go land on the ground and rove around, or even to go get a sample return and bring it back to Earth. So let's imagine that you hypothesized that this planet could potentially have life. You might want to return a sample and analyze it for life. But where to land? Well, you would need to know a lot more first. But you might decide you're going to go as a team and land and return with one of those little brown features that you can see. That As a team, that's what you want to do. And so you send your observer to go and return that little brown feature. And you analyze it with those very delicate sensors that you happen to have, everyone does, on their nose. So you would take that little brown piece and analyze it and smell cloves and think, oh, we have found life. That's evidence of life. So that, in a nutshell, is how you would do Strange New Planet. Let's go ahead and switch back to the main camera. So those are some of the different steps that you would take. For each step, the observers need to return and report their observations to the team. The team needs to develop the hypotheses and new questions to justify funding for the next mission. And often we use more than one planet. Often we use two or even three planets. And you can have them orbiting each other or not rotating during it. It's, it can indeed be a wonderful activity. And there are so many different extensions and changes. The OSIRIS-REx mission is going to be arriving at the asteroid Bennu and returning a sample soon. So um, yes. We are running out of time, folks. How would you? implement these activities at your facility. Let's go ahead and um, let's change our format here and let you all start typing some of your different ideas and questions about what you see and what you're thinking and how you would do these at your site. And while you're doing that, Brooks, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and do a drawing. There's going to be a survey. We'd love your input. And when you fill out the survey online at that website that you can see, you will get a certificate. But we would like to give some door prizes. I happen to have three posters, three Cassini, well, three posters of Saturn. And we are going to mail three posters of Saturn to three people who are here with us. Brooks, um, go ahead and let us know. Uh, uh, can you go ahead and either do a drawing for three people or let us know what numbers we should pick between one yeah, and what? Between, between one, and, one and 61. Between one and 61. OK. So let's go ahead and um, Yolanda, do you have that Google app opened? Nope. OK. Let me go ahead and I will. Google has this wonderful thing for generating random numbers, random number generator. And so we are going to generate between 1 and 61. OK, and our first number that we're generating is number 22. 22. OK. Uh, do you want to do all three, or do you want to do one at a time? Yeah, all three. And the second number is 42. 42. And the last number is 19. 19. Great. Let me go pull the names for these real quick. OK. And so in addition to the Saturn poster, we're also going to send a variety of bookmarks, uh, Year of the Solar System bookmarks, and a, a little sun that has a scale Earth on it, scale how big the Earth would be relative to the sun and how far away they would need to be. So. All right, Christine. So our first winner, this is going to be number 19, is Brianna Zimmerman. Brianna Zimmerman, if you are here, please type something in the chat box. Who is our second our winner? Our second winner is going to be Elizabeth uh, Weislick. Uh, we Weislick. I'm sorry, I don't. I'm not good with the pronunciations. W e i s l a k. And our last winner, 42, is going to be Jennifer Dye, D y e. So Jennifer Dye, please chat something in the chat box. Let us know that you're here. Elizabeth, please let us know that you are here. And uh, and you folks have just a couple seconds to let us know that you are here, or we are going to give your prizes to somebody else. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you 10 seconds. Yeah, 
nine, eight, seven. Okay, we're going to go ahead. And it appears that they are not actually with us. So we are going. Yep, they're not with us. We're going to do three more numbers. Okay, next number is 48 and 3 and 17. 48, 3, and 17. Brooks? All right, number 48. Let me pull this up real quick. That is going to be Paula Spoo, uh, S P O O. Paula S P O O. She's typing. I can see that she is typing. So, yay, we have a winner, Paula. Woo! Okay, and our second number is? Uh, that is going to be Adrian Driver. Adrian Driver, if you are here, let us know that you are here. Type something in your chat box. And then the last one? The last one is Carmen Latona. Carmen Latona. If you are here, Carmen is here. Yay! Okay, so Paula and Carmen are here, and they are winners. Um, uh, I think Adrian? Okay, so we have winners. Carmen, Adrian, and Paula, you have won. Congratulations. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, emailing me your address and contact information, we will get those door prizes mailed out to you as soon as possible. And folks, um, no P.O. boxes, please. We need a physical address. These are going to be FedEx to you. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we uh, hope that you will take the survey about part one for our webinar. Part two will start in about 15 minutes. So in 15 minutes, we will start part two. But uh, please let us know. We'd, uh, we'd love to have your feedback on, let me go ahead and, and continue here. Yeah, Christine, I, I can go ahead and get it on that slide if you'd like. That would be awesome. Great. Here we go. So there's a variety of resources, uh, websites, and we will be putting this website and the PowerPoint up for you. Um, uh, so you will have access to the, the recording after it's all done and polished and up on the website, and we will let you know when that happens. And in the meanwhile, we hope you will come join us again in about 15 minutes. Uh, any final words, Brooks? No. Okay. No, that sounds great. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll log on about uh, one forty and, and just kind of um, say, say hello to everybody and get you ready. So we'll see you guys in about 10 to 15 minutes, okay? See you soon. See you all soon. Four other activities. Um, none of the next ones should explode. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
for this half of our webinars today. I've got a question about Mars for you. So our first poll question for you, do you personally want to travel to Mars someday? Brooks, can you go ahead and open up the poll? And this one doesn't have a right or wrong answer, of course. This is all up to you. Are you interested in going to Mars? And so far, we've got a variety of answers. 16 of you said definitely not. 10 of you would consider it. Six are not sure. And six are absolutely, absolutely would like to go. Um, let's go ahead and close out that poll in five, four, three, two, and one. And so we've got a variety of opinions here. Um, a lot of you really are not planning on going to Mars, but some of you would love to, and some of you are not really sure. Thank you so much. Um, let's go ahead and close that poll out. And um, yes, Yolanda, please sync the system up for me. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So if you were planning a trip to Mars, there's many things to consider. And we have a, a game that uses cardboard and paper and a dice, or a die. Um, and so I'm going to have our team come on up here to the front, to the camera. Um, we've created a large uh, dice here just by taking a box and putting numbers on it. But you can use a small dice as well. Yolanda, come on over and let me ha give you the die. And so traveling to Mars, come on in this view, Andy. Traveling to Mars would take, so Steve is holding the poster. And Andy over here is going to be our participant. Um, takes a variety of stages. It takes numerous steps to get to Mars. Um, and in this game, participants move to different posters. Here we've got step three, ice. They get to choose a couple of different step threes in terms of what they want to do at Mars. But there's a launch one, and there's a return one, and there's a uh, on route to Mars poster. And for each poster, they start at the first one. And the person is going to roll the dice. So you'll want to go ahead and drop the dice. <laughs> not, let's not hit anybody. Um, <laughs> and she rolled a four. So Andy, could you see if, if you were the participant, he would pick number four, which says flight surge. And each of these has a different person. Um, and what does it say that one does? Uh, your spacesuit kept you safe from the thin, cold Martian atmosphere and radiation from the sun. Go to step four, return. So the person who rolled the four would get to go to the next poster and roll again at the next poster to see whether they immediately are successful in returning or if they have to take a few tries and do some more work before they can return back to Earth. Um, on the other hand, you want to go ahead and roll again, and let's roll for you this time. Let's roll again. And she rolled. She follows her number, but we, we've already seen what the flight surgeon said. She rolled a three, so three, the flight activities officer. Yolanda, can you see what the flight activities officer says if you are at this poster? Your rover's wheel has gotten stuck on a rock, and you must clear a path to smoother ground. Roll again. So that person would have to stay at this poster and roll again. Sometimes you might have to even start over again at the beginning. Your mission might get canceled. So it's just it's sort of a, a game that you move around to the different steps and start over again. And uh, that's how it works. And thank you very much, folks. Um, you can retire over to the table where we're going to be demonstrating our next activity. Yay. But, um, but that's how it goes. It's pretty simple, pretty easy. It has all of the papers that you need. All you do is you print them out and you make them into flaps on your posters. If you don't want to put them on posters, just tape them directly to the wall. Um, and, and very simple. They learn more about the different missions, the different people that are involved in the missions. And Caroline says that she can see adults enjoying the game, too. Um, so that is our first activity, A Trip to Mars. And a few different people are typing. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to finish typing just to see what other things you might have to say about the, the activity before we proceed to the next one. And while you're typing, yes, all of the flaps are available in, in a PDF. So, and it's very easy to do. Very simple, doesn't use a lot of materials. And we've seen uh, kids become very involved in this and do it over and over and over again. And yes, a large die really does add to the appeal, Kelly, and you are exactly right. So, um, 
And while people are continuing to type their thoughts, let's, hmm, let's switch back to the other format, Brooks, um, so that we can continue on as well, because um, it kind of got us stuck there. And Yolanda, can you resync it for me? Um, and while we're doing that, yes, club discussions, that's a great idea. I have a question for you. Sorry, Brooks. I just needed them to see the question. What are some of the features that we find on Mars? So for instance, does Mars have mountains or lakes or streams? What are some of the features that we find on Mars? Let's go ahead and switch, switch back to the chat format so everybody can. We're going to give you 30 seconds to type in what features do you find on Mars? What features do you find on Mars? And it appears that the wrong PowerPoint is open right now. So sand uh, and rock, riverbeds, mountains, ice, hills, craters, volcanoes. Not everyone realizes that Mars does indeed have all of these features. It does have dried up stream or river beds. It does indeed have volcanoes. So you guys are showing the depths of your knowledge. Excellent. <laughs> Maybe Matt Damon. <laughs> Excellent. Let's go ahead. Awesome. Awesome. OK. And we're going to switch back to the other format so we can. And uh, Joey, let's switch cameras as well. And we're going to have. Yolanda and Steve play a game. Um, we are going to play Mars Match. So uh, Joey is switching to the other camera. Mars Match is a game where you get to play, um, you get to match different uh, cards, images of Earth and Mars to compare features. And so they uh, are going, there's numerous ways to do this. Here's an example. And, and Andy has, uh, who helped to create this, wanted me to make sure that you know that the Grand Canyon and uh, this uh, Chasma here are, are not exactly pure analogies because they didn't form the same way. One of them formed from Mars crust stretching and the Grand Canyon formed from water erosion. And they're also not quite the same size as you can see where one is five miles across and the other one is 62 miles across. Um, but that is... Um, um, a little bit about it. Um, let's go ahead, Brooks, and switch to the version where they can see half the screen as video, so they can see what's going on here. Brooks and Yolanda are trying to match the Earth images and the Mars images. So some of these images that they have are from here on Earth, and some of the images that they have here are from Mars. And what they need to do is they need to match each Earth image to a Mars image that's of a similar feature. So for instance, um, the one that we showed on the screen was this chasma is similar to this one of the Grand Canyon. So th that would be a match. And now that they've started sorting them out, uh, it's going to be a race as to who can do it the fastest. <laughs> Yolanda has seen these images before, but she's never had to match them before. Steve hasn't seen this set before, but he happens to be a Mars scientist, so he has a bit of an edge up. So <laughs> we will see who gets it done the fastest. Now, Steve was asking earlier if there was a prize for who won. <laughs> and um, maybe, maybe the prize will be some chocolate. Maybe, maybe we'll offer some chocolate as a prize. There are numerous ways to play this game. You can have individuals do it. You can have teams do it. You can play it like memory or concentration, where they are turning them over and trying to remember which ones are where. They, uh, similar features. Now, the M's stand for Mars, and the E's stand for Earth. So if it's got an M, it needs to be matched to an E. OK? And the other thing that might help a little bit is on the back of some of them, there are descriptions of what it is on the backs of some of them that can also be used. So that can help, especially with some of the younger kids who might play. The other thing that we've done sometimes is we've given each person in a large group a single image or two images. And they have to go around and try to match their image 
with an image that somebody else in the group has. And this can be challenging. And we can see that Steve is pulling ahead. <laughs> but yeah, he, as I mentioned, he is a Mars scientist, so that makes it a little bit easier. <laughs> Whereas if you have, uh, this can take, uh, for individuals doing it on their own, you would want to give them at least 15 minutes. On the other hand, if you are doing it in a large group where people are wandering around, it might go a little bit faster. And Steve is done. <laughs> so Steve, um, was this activity pretty easy or, or difficult for you? Or are there any images or matches that you agree with or disagree with? It's uh, pretty easy for me, actually. Uh, all of these features we, we haven't seen on Mars. So there's uh, a lot of analog uh, sight on, on the Earth features, so it's really straightforward. A lot of analogs here on Earth. Whereas for Yolanda, she, she hasn't really had time to even start processing what these images are of. Um, so can you uh, tell me about a couple of the images that you, that you can see on here? Do you see any volcanoes here? I see a crater. You see a crater, a Mars crater. Do you see any craters from Earth? That one right there, awesome, awesome. So yes, you can match a crater. Um, I see a volcano here from Mars. Can you find a volcano from Earth? Um, yeah, now the volcano from Earth is an island that has some clouds. And it's a little bit hard to tell. But on the back of it, it says that this island of Hawaii is a shield, shield volcano. So some of the kids might need to use the information on the back to help them with it. But anyway, that is how, yes, that, it is that one. So all done. Yay. Yay. That's how the game is played. We're going to go back to the main screen here. Thank you so much, Yolanda and Steve. And that does show how it is so much easier, of course, if you are an expert to play these games. Um, maybe a little too easy. So you might not want to play this against a Mars scientist. But you can use it as an icebreaker, hand each person one card or two cards, ask them to find somebody else that matches. You can have them work in small groups to match all the cards. You can have them play memory or concentration for two players. So all sorts of different ways to do it. Yes, you can have the science teachers team up and face the students. You can have a science teacher do against a bunch of students that maybe you break up the cards into smaller groups for the kids. So awesome idea. Hey, Chris. Um, Yes. We also had a conversation that's uh, kind of uh, uh, tangential, but about the weather on Mars. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe Steve might want to jump on chat and just talk about what it's like. Uh, we were chatting about weather at your location earlier on, but maybe we could talk about weather on Mars. Absolutely. Now, Steve's actual uh, research doesn't in come on over here for a second. Steve's research doesn't involve weather so much, but. Um, yeah, but I can tell you, uh, Mars right now it's uh, it's very dry. Um, it's very cold. The temperature uh, range is about minus two twenty F to uh, six uh, sixty sixty eight F, and uh, the the energy temperature uh, on Mars uh, is is pretty cold. It's about uh, minus twenty Celsius uh, right now, and the the um, it has uh, some dust storm on Mars, and it's, uh, it has uh, seasons on Mars, and uh, also, let's see, what else? Um, right now, uh, the, uh, the, the atmosphere is pretty thin. Uh, the uh, pressure is, is about uh, six minibars, something like Very that. Very low pressure. Very low pr pressure, yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty much some basic stuff on Mars. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank sure. you so much. Plus, Andy's also on, on the chat box. And so if there's specific other questions, he can respond to some of those as well on the chat box. Um, so it we are more than halfway, uh, well, not quite halfway done with our webinar. But the next two activities are going to take a little bit longer. So we wanted to give us more time for these activities. Um, searching for life. So this one can be done in conjunction with the Mars theme if you want to, if you want to talk a little bit more about life and what it is and how we search for it. Um, Mars is one of the locations 
that could potentially in the past have been inhabited because it does have signs that there is water or there was water at some point and there, there's definitely frozen water still on Mars and there may be liquid water underground but we don't really have any solid evidence of that yet. There's, there's some, a lot of ideas and a lot of data that is being collected to confirm whether or not there's liquid water underground currently. Um, there's definitely frozen water underground. So talking about life, let's go ahead and let's talk about the activity and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about what life is and how we look for it. So in this activity, your participants are going to uh, work in groups and they're going to be using three cups of material. I'm going to switch over to the Elmo now um, and at this Elmo you're going to be able to see um, some cups that we've added here and each of the cups has, there's a cup that's been labeled A, a cup that's been labeled B, and a cup that's been labeled C. Each of them is half filled with sand and other mystery ingredients. One or more may have life. You can invite the kids to look at it, to poke their fingers around in it and explain what they see. They can smell, they can talk about what they're seeing, make some observations before they add some hot water. They're going to be adding hot water and a source of energy to see how that affects life. In this case, the source of energy that they're going to add is sugar. And I had sugar packets sitting out here. Um, let me see if we can locate our missing sugar packets. Uh, Andy, Yolanda, you guys know where the sugar packets are? Because they were sitting right here. Um, this happens. While we're looking for the missing sugar, the sugar is going to be our source of nutrition to feed the life if there is life there. Um, and there we go. There we go. It's been covered up by a piece of paper brilliantly. So when we do this activity, we usually have kids work in small groups. And each small group has all three cups. So you might have a small group of five kids. I'm going to add the sugar, one sugar package for, per cup. Um, so you might need as many as 21 cups and a fair amount of sand and our mystery ingredients, which we'll talk about afterwards. So we've added our sugar, and we have some very hot water. Now, you don't want the hot water to be boiling so that it's dangerous for the kids, and you don't want it to, to, to kill any life that might be inside of the cup. And we're going to see what happens. Cup A, do you observe some things happening to A or to B or to C? What words do you see? What words would you use to describe what you're seeing? This one is A. Let me put them in order. This one is B, and this one is C. What do you observe? Fizzing. Fizzing. Which ones are fizzing? A, B, C, all of them? A is really foamy right now. A is absolutely really foamy right now. And, and C is bubbling a little bit, and I see, I see a few bubbles in B. So we see some different features going on. Now, while we're making these observations, let's talk a little bit about life and what life is. Um, because we need to know what we're looking for here. Knowing what we're looking for is kind of tricky. Hmm. What do you think? when you think of life. When you think of life, let's talk about how we define life. Well, first of all, why do we need a definition? Well, we need a definition so that we know what we're looking for, right? How can you search for life if you can't define it? So we need, we need to define it. You might have some examples about something that tells us what, uh, whether something is alive or not. Um, Let's go ahead and let's keep the camera, but um, let's go ahead and switch to the chat window. Um, so that way we can... Now, I've noticed that when we switch to the chat window, sometimes the PowerPoint that's showing is the wrong PowerPoint. I apologize for that. Ignore the PowerPoint that you can see there, folks. And type in for me, 
what is an example of something that's alive? Or how would you define life? Activity shows life. Yeast is alive. Yes. So activity does show life, um, potentially. Something that breathes. Does all life breathe? Do, do bacteria breathe? Does yeast breathe or move? Movement, growth, organic. So trying to define organic can be a little tricky, but yeah. Response to stimuli, it reproduces. Life reproduces, absolutely. So do computer viruses. So this is a little tough. Changes over time, absolutely. So, so life activity shows life. We've got, we've got, you know, breathing and growing and movement. Uh, but sometimes this is difficult. Like I say, a computer virus um, can reproduce. It doesn't move and it doesn't breathe. And I don't know that it responds to stimuli. Maybe it does. Doesn't really change over time, though. Change over time is great. Made of cells, absolutely. Although, if we're looking for life on another planet, it may or may not be made out of what we think of as traditional cells. So you want to have a conversation with your audience about what life is and what some of the characteristics are. Breathing, yes. All life here on Earth requires a source of, of ingredients, oxygen or something else. Absolutely. Um, life does respond to stimuli. It changes, it grows, it reproduces. Um, one scientist defined life as something that it does something and it keeps doing it. So that idea that Caroline had about activity. Um, life does something and it keeps doing it. Cup A bubbled. But it isn't bubbling anymore. Cup B bubbled a little bit, and it isn't bubbling anymore. C is doing something. C is doing something. So we are going to keep our eyes on this, and we will come back to this experiment in a few more minutes. We're going to go into another activity, and we will come back to this one in a few more minutes and see what happens. So. Um, and, and see what further observations we can make. Excellent. But thank you all for your comments. Caroline, Laurel, Carmen, all of you. Lynn, Janelle. Yes. And we're syncing up again. And I have a poll question for you. Have you ever been sunburned? Again, no right or wrong answer here. Have you been sunburned? We're going to give you 15 seconds to answer. And this is a lead into our final activity for today. And 23 four of you so far have said 24 of you have been sunburned multiple times. We have a few people who haven't really been sunburned, or somewhat, but not to where their skin peeled. And we're going to close it out in five, four, three, Two and one. And most of you have been sunburned, but some of you haven't really experienced this. Sunburn, uh, getting sunburned can be a painful experience, and it is relevant to Mars. You may ask, why is it relevant to Mars? What does sunburn, what does what do sunburns have to do with Mars? Mars doesn't have an ozone layer to protect you. So if you went to go visit Mars, all of you who indicated that you might go visit Mars, um, you would be in danger of getting sunburned badly, um, not just slightly, but fatally. So our next activity will talk about how to protect yourself, how Mars life might protect itself, how we protect ourselves here on Earth um, with uh, an activity called UV Kid. So uh, in this activity, use common materials and beads to construct something. And um, we are going to, uh, first of all, why don't we go ahead and, hmm. We're doing pretty good on time, actually, aren't we? Um, let's go ahead for this one. And Yolanda, can you go ahead and start sharing your camera? We are going to take a little field trip outside. Um, Andy and Steve, uh, can you um, go ahead and show Yolanda's camera, first of all, our UV creations? We have a couple different UV creations here. 
And go ahead and yeah, get nice and close there. So Andy has a, a little UV uh, creation, and so does Steve. Um, don't blame either of them if they look a little weird. I made them. <laughs> Andy's is supposed to represent an alien, an alien that has beads, and um, and Steve's is a little person, like the picture that you see in the PowerPoint. Each of these has some regular beads, but they also have ultraviolet beads. And the ultraviolet beads are the ones that are, are somewhat, somewhat clear. Let's hold it still because it's flashing. So let's hold it still in, in place for a few seconds there. So some of the clear ones. Andy, can you point to one of the UV ones again? That one right there. And Steve, um, why don't you go ahead and point to one of the UV beads on yours as well? Um, the one in, yeah, in between the blue ones there are some UV beads. So they're somewhat clear here inside. We're inside. We have the windows open, but we're inside. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a little field trip outside and see how these change as we go outside. Um, right now, their beads haven't changed yet, but they change really quickly sometimes when we go outside. So, um, and the video looks great here, but um, okay. Okay, now we're going to step outside. And get nice and close to them. So some of the beads are changing yellow, yellow or yellow, orange, yellow, yellow and orange. orange, and some of them have changed blue. Some of them have changed blue or yellow or orange. So we've got beads that have changed colors very quickly. And when we go back inside, even though it's cloudy today, even though it's cloudy, the beads still changed color in a matter of less than a couple seconds. Less than a couple seconds, they, changed, they started changing colors. So we're going to go inside and talk about how to design a protective covering for our UV creations. Okay, so you uh, were able to see there that the beads changed color in a matter of seconds. We're going to go over here to the side camera, and we're going to talk about designing materials uh, for our UV creations here. Um, Steve and Yolanda and Andy, just testing the beads doesn't tell us anything. What we would actually do with the kids, the main part of this that makes it more inquiry-based, is inviting the kids to create something that may or may not protect their personal alien clothing, whether it's clothing or whether it is um, a habitat. They would create a habitat or clothing and then create a hypothesis as to how effective it would be at protecting UV kid, UV alien, UV dog or cat or horse or, or butterfly. Do start to change color after you come back inside. These beads are are getting paler, but they're still they're still yellowish, and Andy's are still bluish. So in some cases, these may take a couple minutes to turn back to their original color. So they would design something, whether it's... Hey, um, Christine and LPI, yes, I just want to cut in real quick. I believe your audio is coming in through Yolanda's cell phone and not your microphone. Um, so it's a little off right now. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and turn off, off the sound from the cell phone. And you're going to... Um, you can have the kids... I'm not 
not on anymore. You can see that. I thought I had. Hey everybody, just bear with us for one second. We're just getting some audio issues figured out and we'll be on in just a second. Yellowish. Testing, can you hear us now? Coming through, Christine. You sound good. Awesome. Okay, so... Um, so, i um, not quite sure where we cut out. Um, just to let you know, we came back in... Hey everybody, this is Brooks at SSI. I'm just going to jump on while they're, um, it looks like some of their uh, audio equipment may have crashed for just a second. But with this activity, um, one of the fun parts for kids is, or, or for your patrons, is designing these different um, outfits almost, if you will, uh, these different protective measures, things like um, clothes, um, different um, materials that can protect, um, protect your UV kid from those different rays. person and can you hear us hey Christine you're back on we'll see yep, if we you're back the on video to start working too Joey if you want to switch cameras and switch back again maybe that'll unfreeze it or um so while Joey's trying to get the cameras to, to work right here we go there well it, <laughs> the wrong one. While we're getting the cameras working, you will, um, right now what's happening is Yolanda and Steve and Andy are all creating some sort of attire, whether it be clothing or a protective uh, cave or a cocoon, something, excellent, we're set, for their UV, for the UV creation. And um, you can give them saran wrap, you can give them card stock, cardboard, you can give them construction paper, tissue paper, you can try all sorts of materials, uh, bags, plastic baggies. Um, Andy has created something. Andy, can you tell me a little bit about what it is you're, you've used here and how well you think it might work? <coughs> okay, so I've, I am hypothesizing that because uh, UV is near the blue end, of the spectrum, uh, actually just beyond the blue end of the visible spectrum. I've covered all my beads with three different types of blue colored material, thinking that, well, maybe that will reflect blue light. And so I've got construction paper, tissue paper, and the saran wrap. See maybe which one of those might work better. And so the next step that Andy would do is he would take it outside. It, um, and then bring it back in and then uncover them to see how well they stayed, whether they changed color or not. Awesome. You want to try that? Yes. Yes. So Amy's gonna go gonna go take that off and try it. Steve, tell me about what you're doing here. That's a pretty similar approach as a animation using those kind of materials to cover the bees. He's got some blue saran wrap and yeah. some Black construction paper. Yeah, I'm not sure black one will work or not, but I think a blue one, this one, I think this one will work well. He thinks the blue one will work well, but he's not sure about the black one. Okay, so after he's done tying it on securely so it doesn't come off, 
He's going to go test it and bring it back and tell us how well it worked. So while he's doing that, I'd love to hear from you folks. What do you think of this activity? Now, you can do this activity in a pretty short period of time, or you can take an extended period of time with it. Um, um, I, I've done it in as short as 15 minutes, but I've taken as long as an hour with it because you want the kids to have an opportunity to be creative when it comes to constructing their UV creature and testing and constructing a habitat or clothing, attire, something. So Steve is going to go test his. Andy, come back and tell us how well did it work. He's, he's, he's he took his outside. He's unclothing it now. <laughs> It appears it's completely protected it. I'm sure maybe it's a little yellow, but not really. Uh, the tissue paper blocked everything, and so the construction paper. So, so all three of them were effective. The, the cellophane wasn't as. Was not as effective. OK, so the cellophane was not as effective as the construction paper and the tissue paper. Yay! Awesome. So that's how that would work. And Steve is checking on his now. And while he's doing that, um, Let's go ahead and switch to the ELMO, because we have some interesting results on the ELMO now in the past few minutes. So A was the one that fizzed a lot at the beginning. But it's, and it still has a couple bubbles in there, but it's not doing a whole lot. B it didn't do much to begin with. It bubbled a couple little bits. But C, as you can see, looks really different. C is, um, is foamy. There is really no other word for it. They each also. Um, you can have the kids uh, analyze what they smell like. And I can tell you that the kids might tell you, well, Yolanda, come on over here and tell me what you see and what you smell. Yes. What do you smell as you come over here? What does it smell like? Mm. Do I smell each one? Um, smells like bread. Smells like bread, and that's what kids would say as well. C smells like bread. A and B don't have an odor, actually. Um, also, I want you to touch each of them and see if you notice a difference in their temperature. Warm. They're all warm right now? A is not as warm. A is cooler. C is, as, is warmer than B. So C is the warmest of them right now. And that may, may continue, actually. So C did something, and it's continuing to do it. And, and while, um, uh, and Joey, let's switch back to this camera. Thank you. Um, so Steve is done um, analyzing his experiment. Steve, what would you say the results of your experiment are? Uh, I think uh, the one with the black one uh, cover still have a, got some uh, UV light. Some light went through the construction paper? Right. Uh, but for this one, I think it's protect the bees very well. The saran wrap did a, did a pretty good job of protecting it. And I'll let you folks know that a little bit of saran wrap doesn't do a very good job, but a lot of saran wrap can absolutely do a pretty good job on it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK. Well, I think we should begin to conclude this. Um, here we go. Let's go ahead and let's switch to the chat format. And I'd love to hear what your ideas are with all the activities we've done today. What would you change? How would you modify things? How would you make them fit for your audiences? Are they things that would work with your audiences? Um, how would you fit them into your programs? So Jennifer said that she did one of the activities earlier with the STEAM Club, and it went really well. And the idea of change over time does make a lot of sense. Uh, Paula d made bracelets instead of people. And bracelets are great. I like the really important part, though, about testing it, about trying new things with it and testing to see how well they protect or don't protect. So that way you can do. Um, and Paula also said something about using an infrared thermometer to take the temperatures of the mixtures in the cups. Absolutely. If you've got one of the, those of you who have some technology, you can take temperatures of the different uh, different cups and measure them. And the other modifications. Mars Match Game would be fun for an adult, for a group of adults. Awesome. And thermometers, of course, are always fun.
And while you are continuing to type in your modifications and adjustments and ideas, we are going to um, start the drawings. We're going to give away one more Saturn poster. I have one more Saturn poster to give away. And then I have some other posters as well that we are going to give away. So I have one more Saturn poster. And uh, we're going to also give away a few other posters. So um, Brooks, how many people are we drawing between? Between one and what? Yeah. Uh, one and 51. One and 51. So let's see what our numbers are. Between one and 51. One and 51. We'll generate three random numbers. The first random number is 18. The second number is 10. And the last number is 26. All right. Give me just one moment. And Ellen says she loves the signs of life test. The kids always love reactions. Um, and the summer reading program theme is space. And in addition to the activities that we've shared with you, there are so many other space activities. At the StarNet resources section, of, they've got all sorts of activities. And then at our Explore website, we've got a variety of activities. We hope you will look at them and let us know what you think. All right. We have three winners. Um, it's going to be, let's see, Connie uh, Whitney. So Connie, if you're here, type in that you're here. Who else? Either Whitney or Whitney. Uh, Amy Waltrip. And Amy, let us know if you're here. And our last one is Suzanne Kestel. K-E-S-T-E-L. Suzanne. All right, Amy's here. Amy's here. Yay! <laughs> We're going to give the others a couple seconds to respond. What we're and Danielle, just to say, you don't have to wait for the 2019 summer reading to, to use these ideas. Uh, you can use these ideas for any program, obviously. Of course, they will tie in well for the 2019 summer, uh, summer reading program. Absolutely. Absolutely. What were the other two names one more time? Uh, yeah, the other two names were Connie uh, Widney or Widney and Suzanne Kestel. I know some folks had to leave early, so um, okay. we might need to, to draw a couple of more. Okay. Well, let's let's do that then. Let's fifty one and let's try nineteen. Is nineteen one of the ones we already said? Uh yes. Can we do a different one other than nineteen? We can. Fifty one. Fifty one. The last one. And twenty nine. <laughs> And 29. Okay. All right. 51 is going to be Vanessa um, Hartel, H-A-R-T-E-L. So Vanessa Hartel, if you are here, speak up. And number 29. The name. Vanessa says she is here. Okay. Great. And the last name? That is going to be. Nancy Logan. Nancy Logan, are you here? Yay! OK. Congratulations to all of our winners. Again, to Amy and Vanessa and Nancy, please email me to let me know your address. Uh, can't be a PO box. has to be a real address. We're going to be FedExing uh, posters and other materials to you, some bookmarks. And um, thank you all so much for joining us. Please go ahead and fill out that survey. We, we greatly appreciate your help with feedback as we do webinars and would love to know more about what interests you and how we can make them better. And please do continue to contact us. Keep in touch. There are, um, let me move forward here to the last page. There are a number of websites here that you can reach us at. You can reach me at that explore email address, explore at lpi.usra.edu. But for most of you, you uh, receive some emails from you in advance of today with information. So you can always just respond as well. 
And we will let you know when the recording is available online. Brooks and Kelly, and do you have any final comments? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to, of course, say thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, we do have a couple of other webinars, too. If you go to our StarNet uh, Libraries page and, and look for those couple of webinars, uh, next week we'll be talking about the After School Alliance and the Lights on After School program. That's mm -hmm. September 19th. October 4th, we're going to be joined by Brian Day of NASA. We're going to be talking about International Observe the Moon Night and ways you can integrate into that programming, programming uh, or inter integrate that event into your programming. So just make sure to follow us. Um, you know, I'll send an email out to some of you guys, uh, just kind of letting you know about upcoming webinars. And if you, when we close out this chat room, you'll be redirected to that SurveyMonkey link where you'll be able to print out your certificate of attendance afterwards. So again, if you have any trouble, just email me, email Christine, and we can get you um, the link to the survey and the link to your certificate. We'd also love to hear from you if you have a chance to try these activities in your programs. Please go back to the StarNet uh, STEM Activity Clearinghouse and submit a review um, and help everyone find the ones that are working uh, best uh, and you know, throw out your ideas for what you had to, to do to modify things. So we'd love to hear back from you as you try these out. Thank you all so much. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to join you today. We appreciate it. And have a great day. Thanks, Christine and everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.